Hey everyone, how's my big family around the world doing? If this is your first time watching, we're honoured to have you here. Don't forget to like, subscribe and join the family. Why did flying boats go extinct overnight? Saunders Row Queen This video isn't taking off without the flying cruise ship brought to you by Squarespace. If that didn't grab your attention, let me tell you, this project was straight up insane. Post-war UK engineers dreamed up the future of travel, a flying cruise ship that could carry 1,000 passengers spread across five decks with bars, dining rooms, showers, and a crew of 42 catering to your every need. This massive flying boat was supposed to take you anywhere in the world while offering a luxury ocean liner experience in the sky. But here's the kicker. There was way more to this story. There were three different versions, each one crazier than the last. One was nuclear-powered, another was even bigger, with two massive hull openings, and the last one was built with perfect futuristic tech. So why was it all scrapped? Let's dive into the mystery of what really happened to these wild-flying cruise ships. They called it the Saunders Row Queen, and just like the UK's actual Queen, it was meant to be the crown jewel of British aviation. The idea first popped up in the early 1950s when P&O Shipping requested a flying ocean liner. It was supposed to be the largest passenger seaplane ever conceived. But what really set this beast apart from other crazy aviation concepts? Pure luxury. Think first-class treatment on a long-haul flight but dialed up to 11. First-class passengers would have private bars, dining rooms and even personal showers. Meanwhile, economy passengers would bunk in train-style compartments that transformed from seats into six-person sleeping berths. But what really made it different from planes today wasn't just the luxury. It was the fact that everyone had actual headroom and could just walk around the plane like it was a floating hotel. Oh, and the crew? Forty-seven people in total, forty of them flight attendants, serving passengers through elevators connecting all the decks. They had to work in seven separate shifts as the plane travelled across the world. But here's where things get wild. The engineering behind this thing was just as insane as the concept itself. It had four Rolls-Royce Conway jet engines mounted high on the wings to keep them away from sea spray and a smart dual intake system, one for flight and another for water operations. Plus, the engineers bet big on jet technology, making this aircraft a serious flex of 1950s aviation. Rolls-Royce Conways, by the way, were the first turbofan engines ever used in commercial service. You'd find them on aircraft like the Boeing 707 Douglas DC-8 and the Vickers VC-10. So, where was this flying palace supposed to go? Well, the company planned routes like London to Sydney with stops in Cairo, Karachi, Calcutta, Singapore and Darwin. If it had actually been built, it would have revolutionised long-haul travel. But before we get into why this project got scrapped as fast as someone realising they forgot to hit subscribe, let's go back to the beginning and the company behind it. I love this era of crazy aviation tech. Those old-school British engineers fresh out of the war designing insane machines. And as a die-hard aviation fan, I know how important precision, innovation and smooth execution are, whether in the sky or online. That's why I trust Squarespace to run my website. With Squarespace, I built a sleek professional site in just a few steps. No coding, no design headaches. Their award-winning templates and drag-and-drop tools make it easy to keep my brand looking sharp. And just like air traffic controllers guide planes to their destinations, Squarespace's built-in SEO tools help new visitors land on my site with optimized descriptions, automatic sitemaps, and more. So if you're looking to launch your own brand, sell aviation merch, or maybe even start your own YouTube channel, Squarespace makes it easy, stylish, and stress-free. And best of all, you can get 10% off your first domain at www.squarespace.com. Back in the 1930s, if you wanted to cross the ocean, your options were super limited. You could spend a week on a boat, probably seasick the whole time, or hop on what was basically a flying yacht, a massive plane that landed on water. But these weren't just any planes. They were absolute units. Imperial Airways ran these bad boys all over the British Empire, 
letting passengers sip tea and snack on fancy sandwiches while casually stopping at ports from Southampton to Sydney. Meanwhile, traditional ocean liners were still dominating routes like London to New York. But for a while, flying boats were the go-to for long-haul travel. And for good reason. Back in the day, airports were pretty basic, just grass runways. But flying boats? They could land anywhere there was enough water, which made total sense since most big cities were on the coast. And here's the thing. Because they took off and landed on water, they could be way bigger than land planes, carrying more fuel and passengers. That made them perfect for serving far-off colonial outposts, which usually had ports but no airports. The ability to create flight routes without having to build insanely expensive ground infrastructure made flying boats the best way to connect distant parts of the empire before World War II. That's why the biggest flying boat of the time had a fitting name, the Short Empire. It was basically the private jet of its era, except it was more like a private yacht that somehow flew. With comfy cabins and actual sleeping berths, it made other planes of the time look like flying sardine cans. We're talking massive lounge areas, separate bathrooms for men and women, and even private cabins. And it wasn't just the Brits. The Boeing 314 Clipper was so fancy that it made the Titanic look like a dinghy. Pan Am flew these beasts across the ocean, serving full gourmet meals on actual fine china. But just when people were getting used to these floating palaces, some genius came in with a hold my beer moment. They looked at these already massive flying boats and said, nah, not big enough, let's go all out. And just like that, the first flying ship was born. Now, while a lot of industries stalled during World War II, flying boats actually thrived. Many of the British ones were repurposed. If they weren't flying secret routes between London and New York to avoid enemy planes and North Atlantic storms, they were converted into patrol aircraft, hunting down Nazi U-boats. Saunders Row saw the writing on the wall. They knew that when the war ended, the world would need a new flying boat for passenger travel and mail delivery. So, as early as 1943, they started designing something next level. Their new aircraft was going to be the biggest metal flying boat ever built. The specs? 140 tonnes, a pressurised double bubble fuselage, a 214 foot wingspan, and a top speed of 340 miles per hour at 37,000 feet. That last part was a big deal. Most flying boats weren't even pressurised back then. It had a 5,000-mile range and luxury accommodations for 104 passengers. At the same time, the British government came knocking, asking for a new transport and reconnaissance flying boat for military use. So they handed the project to both Saunders Row and Short, which led to the creation of the Short Shetland. But here's the problem. It was a jack-of-all-trades, master of none. It didn't really excel at anything, which made Saunders Row feel like it wasn't their true vision for the future of aviation. But that didn't stop them. They saw it as a test run for their big idea, the Princess. Now the Princess? That was a beast! The largest metal flying boat ever built, with a double-deck pressurized cabin that could carry 105 passengers in ultimate luxury, and its engine setup? Wild! Ten turboprop engines driving six propellers. This thing was the peak of flying boat technology. And in my opinion, the peak of air travel itself. It had two classes, first class and tourist class. Tourist class was kind of like a modern business class seat on a short haul flight. Basic reclining seats. But first class? That was a whole different world. Private twin bed cabins, a dedicated bar, and a separate dressing room. You could literally change into a tux before heading over to the bar for a drink. Seriously, where did that level of luxury even go? Saunders Row envisioned a future where airports would be completely different. Instead of massive runways and terminals, they imagined floating hangars and weatherproof docks where these giant flying boats would land. And here's the kicker. Sanders Row actually got an order for the Princess. A transatlantic airline came to them wanting a long-range flying boat, and they jumped on the chance. 
They chose to power it with the new British Proteus turboprop engines, making this project even more ambitious. By May 1946, they had already won a contract to build three of these bad boys for £2.8 million each, which was insane money at the time. Each engine alone cost £400,000 in 1945 money, which is about £4 million today. So yeah, this thing was stupidly expensive. Things went south real quick during development. The project started running way behind schedule and blew past the budget, which made politicians real nervous. The aircraft's design and the brand new Proteus engine were pushing the limits of engineering, and surprise, surprise, that ain't cheap. Then came the real knockout punch in 1951. The higher-ups straight up changed their minds. They didn't want these planes anymore. Actually, they didn't want any flying boats at all. They had already shut down flying boat services the year before and decided that the future was on land, not water. The problem? The contract was already locked in, and they were halfway through building three prototypes. So the government tried to repurpose them for air transport instead. Finally, on August 22, 1952, the first prototype took flight. Side note, it wasn't even supposed to fly that day. They were just running taxi tests, but the conditions were too perfect to pass up. The water was like a glass mirror, so the pilot just went for it. The massive flying boat spent 35 minutes cruising around, proving that, yeah, the princess could fly, but its engines were kind of disappointing. The prototype managed 46 more test flights, clocking over 100 hours in the air. But the other two prototypes? They never even left the ground. Instead, they were just stored away while the government sat around scratching their heads, trying to figure out what to do with them. And here's the funny part. While they were busy overthinking, the engineers at Saunders Row already knew what the real problem was. The engines. That's why nobody wanted the princess. So they sat down and sketched out two new designs. This time, powered by jet engines. Now this was the 1950s, and everybody was hyped about jets. Saunders Rowe saw the writing on the wall. Of course people want jets. That's why no one's into flying boats anymore. So they reworked the princess into the Duchess, pitching it as the next generation flying boat for airlines. The idea? Jet speed with seaplane flexibility. You'd get the best of both worlds. No downsides, right? Well, despite the hype, the new design was way smaller than the princess. It was supposed to run on fewer engines, have a pressurized air-conditioned cabin, and seat 74 passengers in two separate cabins with a cargo hold in the middle to balance the weight. The cabin also had massive round windows so passengers could enjoy killer views while flying. And no beds this time. The whole point was to fly straight to the destination, no overnight stops needed. Saunders Row really pushed the Duchess hard. They even built a full-scale model and took it to a big aviation expo in the 50s to attract both local and international buyers. Even though it was mainly aimed at commercial airlines, they also pitched military versions for reconnaissance and transport. At one point, an Australian-New Zealand airline even considered ordering some, but that never happened. And here's where things fell apart. Nobody wanted to be the first to order it. And because no one ordered it, no one wanted to invest in its development. Classic Catch-22. With two strikes against them, Saunders Row started wondering if they should just ditch flying boats altogether. But at the last minute, a shipping company hit them up with a wild idea. Could you turn the Princess and the Duchess into a flying ocean liner? At first it sounded crazy, but the problem wasn't the engines or the propellers. It was that the plane wasn't big enough. So they doubled the size, turning it into a massive two-deck flying ship. And that was just the beginning. The design quickly ballooned into a five-deck behemoth, and this was the moment when the Queen was born, you know, the one we all know and love today. But just as everything was coming together, the government and the shipping company bailed. Nah, no thanks. We're investing in land-based planes and ships instead. Saunders Row scrambled to salvage the project. They quickly went back to the Princess and pitched a land-based version. No more water landings, just regular runways. They even upgraded the engines to be way more efficient than the original weak design. And when that plan got rejected, they went totally nuts and took a huge leap. They teamed up with the U.S. government and pitched a nuclear-powered version. Yeah, you heard that right. A nuclear-powered SE aircraft. And that's where the story really gets wild. It was developed by Lowood as part of its twin-hull SE aircraft concept. Yeah, another SE plane. You can check out the video on the channel. So, while the U.S. government straight-up rejected the nuclear-powered version, 
Saunders Row took one last shot and said, hey, what if we designed a double hull version to carry five Saturn rockets for the Apollo program? Honestly, that would have been insane. But just like every other design before it, the answer was a loud and clear no. So what actually happened? Why did flying boats go extinct? And why did nobody want them anymore? The story of how flying boats disappeared from our skies is actually pretty wild. It all comes down to bad timing. They showed up in the wrong place at the wrong time. For example, big flying boats popped up just when aviation was changing, and not in their favor. After WB2, airports were everywhere. All those military airfields built during the war, they were converted into civilian airports with proper concrete runways. Suddenly, one of the biggest selling points of flying boats, being able to land on water when there were no runways around, just didn't matter anymore. And then came jets. Flying boats had always struggled with a huge design headache. They needed a boat-shaped bottom for water landings, which meant extra weight and drag. That was a massive disadvantage compared to sleek land-based planes, which were faster, lighter, and could fly higher. But what really killed them? Maintenance. Salt water is crazy corrosive, and keeping those giant flying boats in the air was a never-ending battle. Even the princess fell victim to this. At one point, the government finally stopped scratching their heads and found a buyer, someone who wanted to start a super-specific airline for transporting cargo and passengers via flying boat. But by then, the princess had been sitting in storage for so long that it started rotting from corrosion. Talk about adding insult to injury. And the final nail in the coffin? Airplanes just got better. Back in the day, being able to land on water in an emergency was a huge safety feature for long-haul ocean flights. But with more reliable engines and more airports popping up along major flight routes, that stopped being an issue. The Princess and every other flying boat became a solution to a problem that didn't exist anymore. Oh, and one last thing, I didn't mention it here, but Saunders Row was also working on a fighter jet version of their plane. It was honestly pretty badass, and it still has a ton of potential today. I'll probably make a full video about it later, so make sure to subscribe and stay tuned. Thanks a ton for watching. Let us know your thoughts in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. At X News, we're committed to bringing you real and unbiased news. See you in the next video.